Okay. So I'm going to have everybody, let's start by doing introductions. Uh, I'm going to start actually down in the end with Tim. I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves. A little, tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about yourself and your relation to narrative and games. Sure. So uh, my name is Tim Cubison. I'm the uh, founder and general manager at Horses Cowboy. We're a company that stands at the intersection of entertainment and technology. So uh, we're based out in LA, and what we do is we try to bridge the two cultures of tech and entertainment. So mostly working in video games, helping put all the actors in the games. Uh, I was casting director, and we produced all the uh, performances for games like Fallout 4, Skyrim, uh, Life is Strange, the Tomb Raider series, uh, the Halo series, the Destiny series, all those type of games. Uh, I've produced, I think, over a million lines of video game dialogue, which is pretty crazy to think about. I've uh, been doing this about 10 years and having a lot of fun, so happy to be here. Hi, I'm Thomas Talbot. I'm a, I'm a physician from the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, we are a place that uh, was founded to create advanced training products for the military. And uh, so I do a lot of serious games work, uh, mostly medical or psychologically focused. And uh, we do a lot with interactive virtual humans, that sort of thing and uh, mixed reality and been doing so for about 17 years. I've been in this field ooh, about 20 years and a little bit longer in television before I was in medical school. Uh, did it, no, um, so I'm Warren Spector. I already told everybody pretty much my background. Uh, but I'm, I'm with Other Side Entertainment right now uh, and uh, all of my 24 games have told stories. Uh, my name is Matt Forbeck. I started out, I grew up in southern Wisconsin, actually in Beloit, Wisconsin, a little town down the road. I started out in tabletop games working with companies like uh, TSR and New Infinities and a bunch of other ones. Uh, I ran a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group, which did Deadlands and Brave New World, which were a bunch of tabletop games. Uh, nowadays, I mostly write novels. Uh, my second Halo novel is coming out on November 14th. My third is already finished and turned over. I also do some video game work. I, did, uh, I worked at Ghost Recon Wildlands. I worked on uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, which I can now finally say today because it just shipped, um, as a script doctor, and I've done bunches of other stuff. I worked at Marvel Encyclopedia, um, lots and lots of other things over the years. I used to work with Tim, actually. And I'm Tim Gerritsen. I used to work with Matt. Uh, <laughs> I started out 25 years ago making Sims for Dynamics, doing A10 Tank Killer and Aces of the Deep and stuff like that, and over the years done a bunch of things, including uh, Bioshock Infinite, Prey, Rune, Dead Man's Hand, uh, Batman Arkham Origin, a whole bunch of stuff in between. Um, now, I've, I've written scripts, I've hired scripters, but I've been all over the map. I'm a producer, designer, I, so that's, that's my tie-in. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is a fantastic panel. I'm um, really looking forward to this. So we're just going to, this is a panel. We will leave some time at the end for Q and A, but if you if you're dying to know something, you know we can we can pause. But the idea is here is to throw out some topics and let these guys riff on it a little bit. So, let's dive right in. Um, what do you guys think is the current state of narrative in video games? What's your opinion of the current state of narrative in video games? I think it's pretty fantastic, personally. I think uh, we're doing more uh, inter interesting and innovative stuff in, in narrative than we ever have before. Uh, we're doing lots of stuff in branching storylines and just showing to people different ways to tell stories in open world so that it becomes more their story than anybody else's in unique ways that couldn't possibly be replicated in any other art form. So I think we're doing some pretty fantastic stuff. Plus they keep hiring you, so I think that's okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's, we're in kind of a schizophrenic time. Uh, there's a part of me that agrees with you that uh, there's a lot more open world uh, action these days uh, and a lot more player driven narrative these days than there used to be uh, and on the flip side we've got a bunch of, of you know interactive movies that I have no interest in I think we're in a era of be beginnings I think compared to what we're going to be able to do what we have now is pretty fairly primitive uh, but I do enjoy the fact that there's some wonderful stories being told out there and being told very well I just think the way we'll interact with those stories is going to change quite a bit. 
Yeah, I, I think it's an exciting time for stories and games. I think the cool thing about games is that we have a di bunch of different ways to tell stories, right? So we can have everything from the interactive movies that some people love and some people hate to, uh, to games that have very in-depth stories but no plot, right? It's purely environmental storytelling. Um, so I think it's cool that we have that diversity and you know, kind of everyone can find uh, the story that fits them. So now that we laid the groundwork a little bit, let's dive into some deeper stuff. <sighs> Diving into technology, is there anything we lack? Is there anything you can, man, on a technological, purely technological standpoint, is there something you wish we had that we just don't? And if that is the case, what would you advocate for to improve narrative? And I know it's a weird one because they're asking a technology <laughs> question right off the bat, but rather than a pure narrative. So. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I know for me, you know, working with actors and whatnot, the holy grail for us has always been uh, fully integrated performance capture. Right, where you can do the face, you can do the voice, and you can do the body all at the same time. And we've gotten close, but it's still terrible, right? Because one, it's incredibly expensive, so only a very, very small percentage can actually use it. But then even when you do it, I think every time we've ever done full performance capture, we have to ADR all the dialogue anyways. Because either the script changes, or the facial capture's not working, or whatever. Um, so I know for me, I would love to get to the point where we can, for games that need full performance capture, we could actually use it. Yeah, for me, Sorry, yeah, we don't have to do it in order. Um, yeah, for me, I'd like to see more of a focus on non-combat AI. Uh, even our open worlds are basically about, you know, I want to kill that thing this way, or I want to kill that thing that way. Uh, and we spend a lot of time on combat AI, and, and frankly, just <laughs> how to navigate through increasingly complex 3D worlds. Uh, and I don't see a lot of uh, forward progress uh, on the non-combat AI stuff. There's a lot of canned non-combat stuff in those interactive movie kind of games I was talking about, but uh, there isn't a lot of uh, open world non-combat stuff. Uh, for example, um, you know, I've, I've had this picture in my head for, for a long time, and by the way, I'm as bad as anybody else. I'm not, I'm not working on this either, okay? Uh, so, so I'm a little bit of a hypocrite, but I've had this scenario in my mind for a long time, and, and I've talked it over with uh, with some friends of mine, um, and it's, I call it the glass of water scenario. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard me talk about that, but uh, it we can't do a scene where there are two characters sitting across from one another with a glass of water in the middle, and first of all, you can't most games you can't knock the glass of water over, which is annoying. But let's assume this is a game where you can knock the glass of water over and knock it in the lap of the person you're talking to and have them respond appropriately. And by appropriately, I don't mean getting a gun out and shooting you <laughs> or standing up and brushing off their pants or uh, saying, oh, don't worry about it. The point is, if we could have AI that was responsive enough and open, as open as our worlds, imagine how that would change games. Um, if if I'm six years old, my, the character on this side is six years old, and the character on the other side is 70, and that kid's grandfather, that response is going to be very different than if there are two 30-year-olds who, you know, I stole that guy's wife. Uh, and nobody's made a game that, I mean, like, you can't even knock a glass over, right? Uh, so the more non-combat AI would be really nice. Yeah, I think, uh, part of, I just like to see story integrated from the beginning. Right, because a lot of times, you know, you bring a storyteller in at the beginning of a game when they're just developing the background and, and the world and everything else, and then they tell you to screw off for about, you know, two or three years, and then you come back at the end and you write all the dialogue after they've assembled everything. So you kind of get this Frankenstein's monster that you're trying to make sure that nobody can see. People see as few of the stitches as they possibly can, and I would much rather see somebody who was working on those kind of problems and integrating them in the game, all the way through from point one. It would require that kind of work. But you know, we're, we're such an action-oriented industry as opposed to a motion-oriented industry or experience-oriented industry that it's going to be a long time, I think, till we get to that point. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I see everything kind of pre-scripted, kind of linear, um, not always, but I, I think I would second about the AI and the, the storytelling capabilities and the interactive capabilities of the characters. I'll talk a little bit about that at 345 in the dialogue agent talk. but. Um, just one example, um, you know, every time you play a game through, you might have a different branch, it might be a little different, but 
all those scenes are the same every time. And they happen at the same moments. Um, and that hasn't really changed uh, in a long time. And, you know, I wonder, you know, if you've done something really well in that battle or something, did you earn that person's trust or is there something, is there, could that dialogue come out at certain times contextually that is important and come out a different way each time? Or maybe not completely come out at all because of the relation you de relationship you develop with the, with the NPCs of the game. I, I think that's where it can get really interesting, but also really hard to do. I think uh, just to add on to that, it, there's a funny story we were talking about last night in Skyrim. I don't know how many of y'all played it, but there's this uh, companion, Lydia, and she has this line where she says, I'm sworn to carry your burden, right? And uh, but the way that she says it is very snarky, almost like, oh my God, you're making me carry your stuff again, right? And so it would be so cool if that was further developed and we had the ability to like find out that relationship uh, you know, deeper as you played the game, because that's really the only moment that is like that. You know, and it's never explained, it never goes deeper, so it would be amazing if we could have, you know, that AI that developed with you and you could really find out who they are. See, in that scenario, what I would want to see is, um, depending on how you treated Lydia, mm -hmm. her, the way she said that would be different. So it didn't have to be snarky. Yeah. It could be joyful that mm -hmm. she gets to do that. Uh, that kind of open-endedness. The other thing I would love to see, and I, I again, I have no idea how to do this, but uh, I would love a virtual dungeon master, mm. you know, a, 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 an AI that drives the story based on the direction the player takes it. Like when you're playing D&D, like tabletop D&D, you'll, you'll run into, I mean, if you're a, a dungeon master, you'll often run into situations where you, you create this amazing combat scenario with an enormous dragon and, you know, incredible treasure, and your players just say, nah, I don't feel like fighting you know, and you and you wink, you you modify the story on the fly to accommodate what your players want to do, and it's probably impossible, which is why it's worth trying. I mean, fail gloriously, guys, right? Fail gloriously. Um, it would be it would be remarkable if, if we could come up with some sort of agent that that could actually adjust the gameplay on the fly. Maybe maybe fifty years from now. I think it'd be remarkable because we have a hard enough time teaching human beings how to do that. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's true. Can I ask a question of the audience? Who here is a writer or a character that you know, does narrative? Oh, I'm okay. now, and that's one of the problems with Dungeons and Dragons originally is that um, you know, if you have a great dungeon master, it's the best experience you can have in any, any kind of entertainment period, right? But if you have a mediocre or a terrible dungeon master, it's just dull and boring, which is one of the reasons that video games actually do a better job than a poor dungeon master in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. right. that, that should be a slogan on a game. You know. <laughs> <laughs> better than a shitty dungeon. It, it's it's funny. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was in TSR, uh, I, used to, I used to look at, at our situation, our publishing situation, and, and think, okay, we've got roughly 15 million people who played this game. Of them, 10% are dungeon masters. Of those, 10% create their own adventures. Of those, 10% are any good. And of those, 0% are publishable. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're right, man. Yeah. Their games probably do a better job already, and I should be quiet about that. <laughs> That's a wonderful dream, though. Yeah. I'd love to see it happen. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's shift uh, focus just a little bit. So there's, there's lots of different types of games out there in how they tell narrative, how they deal with narrative. I chose two just to narrow it down for this purpose of this conversation. Um, I'm calling it specific character versus defined character. And what I mean by that is, so you got Skyrim, I can make a cat woman, a literal cat woman with armor and run around kill things. Other games you play The Witcher, or you play Laura Croft. Uh, playing the, so in, a, you know, in some of these, you're playing the character that the designer or the author of the original source material created. In others, you're creating your own character. Is either approach superior to the other? And I know more, where Warren's going to go with this one. But is either approach superior to the other, or do they both have merit and value? Of course they both have merit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not for me to tell people what games sure. they should make or, or play as much as I would love to. Um, you know, there's, there's value in, in Alara Croft because, well, OK, in, in games like that, typically, the story belongs to the designer. And the designer knows exactly what's going to happen with every step 
or almost almost exactly. Like I mean, when you when you describe the experience of playing oh, a two martyr, you're talking to the mic, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when when you um, play a Tomb Raider game, essentially the description of every player describes the same experience. It's like I was saying this morning, I think games can, can do better than that and allow players to create unique experiences uh, that belong to them. But there's something really powerful about, you know, wasn't it cool when Lara, or when you even, wasn't it cool when you leaped across that chasm and you almost missed, but you grabbed onto it with your fingertips and then you looked up and there was a wolf looking down and you know, every player describes exactly the same experience. And at that point, the way I feel about it is you might as well make a movie. If every player is describing the exact same experience, why are you bothering to go to all the trouble of making a game? That's a huge overstatement, okay? And, and I recognize that. There's, there's the skill aspect of accomplishing that goal when you're playing a game. There's a, there's a skill element even to a game where you're playing a character and every, every, the character does the same thing every every, you know, like you trigger a, you step on an invisible trigger and three guys spawn off screen. I mean, and every player does that. But the power of that is you can tell a great story, you know? Movies are a solved problem. And games that offer that little interaction <laughs> are, are a solved problem to an extent. Whereas games like Skyrim, um, you know, the big open world games, really do belong to the player. You know, it's not just that you can create your own characters, that you can create your own, y your version of the world is gonna be different than another player's. And your story in, in that world is going to be different than other players, which I think is more interesting, but you know, your mileage may vary. If, if you want a great story, play a Tomb Raider game. If you want your story, play Skyrim. But they both have value. Then we get these hybrid games, like uh, Grand Theft Auto or such, right, where it's a lot of open world stuff, but you're playing specific characters and you're, they have specific story arcs that go through as well. So, you, go ahead. No, yes, no, no, I didn't mean to. You said like you're grabbing there. <laughs> I didn't mean to. No, I, so you get these hybrid things where you, know, you try to get the best of both worlds. Doesn't always end up being the best. Sometimes it's the worst of both worlds, but uh, you, you get that sense of, your, of freedom of wandering around, of creating your own side stories, but you're following the same central arc, right? And so there are different ways that people attack these things. One of the main reasons companies like to do uh, main characters like that as merchandise and marketing, honestly. So I, it, you can sell Lara Croft, but you can't sell everybody their own World of Warcraft character, right? Although the, now they have, you can actually 3D print yes, these guys yeah. out, so yeah. <laughs> but you know, they're not gonna make the movie on those guys. They're gonna make the movie, or the, the novels, or whatever else, mm -hmm. out of the ones that they've created for the same player type stuff. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think there's, I don't think there's a better approach. I think, you know, like they've said, they both have merits. I think that there's, the, the games where it's a very defined character, they're plot driven games, which goes back to what he's saying. It's, it's about the plot, it's about the journey, it's not about necessarily your experience. Um, and I think, you know, I agree with Warren, I, I think some of the game's most interesting moments are not plot. You know, it's not telling a story through plot, it's telling a story through the environment, which I think these open world games do well. What's interesting uh, when it comes to casting these characters, right? Uh, it, it's it's a challenge because when we cast Fallout 4, you know, it was the first time that the protagonists, the player characters, were voiced, uh, and there's a big debate whether or not they should be voiced or not voiced. And and when it was finally decided that they should be, uh, it's a challenge because when you're casting uh, Laura Croft, you're casting a very specific character who has a personality. Or when you're casting Nathan Drake, right, he is this snarky kind of fun-loving Indiana Jones type, right. Whereas when you're casting a player character that's going to be created to look like a bunch of different things, uh, you have to be a lot more vanilla. And so it's odd in directing those actors and in casting those actors because you don't want someone with too much personality because if you're creating your cat person, right, and the voice actress is very bombastic, right, then it may not work for you. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing in games. Uh, and, and I guess the question is do we need to voice them or not? I think there's definitely an immersive element of having the voice, but it can be distracting as well. Uh, the other crazy thing that I'm curious about you guys, if you have worked on, is uh, plot-driven games where the protagonist can't speak, right? That's, a, that's an incredible challenge. We worked on <laughs> Command & Conquer 5, one of them, uh, doing the story, and it's just crazy because you have to write, everyone around you has to answer for the player but the player is supposed to be there, and it's just it's a crazy challenge. I don't know if you Try System it. Shock, where <laughs> not only can the character not talk, there are no living NPCs, and you have to tell a story. Oh. 
That's, that's a dramatic challenge. Mm. But you know, the, wait, there are about six things I want to say. Um, the, the voice challenge is, is, a, is a real one. On, on uh, Deus Ex, we had a named character, J.C. Denton. Mm. And, and yet, I wanted it to be the player's experience. So how do you balance those two? And I wanted the character to have a voice mm. and a backstory. But I, I didn't want to give him too much personality because I didn't, like, if you're in the middle of a scene and it's the player's story, I don't know if the player's angry or happy or sad or confused. I don't know if the, the player is, is feeling those emotions. And if the character is expressing anger and the player is feeling confusion, or the, the, the character's feeling anger and the player is experiencing elation, there's that disconnect. And so, man, the poor actor, Jay Frankie, I, I, had, I had to tell him to talk like this and not put any emotion <laughs> into his voice. And obviously, people thought the performance was really bad, and that was exactly what I wanted. Um, <laughs> you know, but that, that was my solution to the problem, and it probably wasn't the best. But, but one other point, um, you know, there, you're right about plot-driven games and, and uh, player-driven games, I guess. Um, but what I try to, I'm not willing to give up the plot, despite all of my, my whining about player experience. I don't like giving up that level of control. So if you look at all of my games, they're all structured in the same way. They're structured where I own the narrative arc. I own wh what you're doing. And I own what makes that important. But the player owns the how that is accomplished. I don't care how the player gets through a door. Most games care how you get through a door. It's ridiculous. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, anyway, OK. Um, <laughs> so it, that's one way to, to, to find the, the compromise. And I, I'm not thrilled with it, but I haven't thought of anything better. So I'm still doing it. If anybody has a better way to not give up narrative control as, as the, the, you know, the, the development uh, as the developer of the game, uh, while still giving the player agency, let me know. But that's the best I've been able to come up with. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, The Walking Dead from Telltale actually does a really good job of that. Where, you know, it, it, every time there's a scene where you know somebody's going to die or not die, you know they're going to die within five minutes, <laughs> right? Because you don't want to have to voice that character for the rest of, of the series. So they get killed off one way or the other. And so what you do really doesn't matter in terms of the of the arc, but emotionally it matters tremendously. Right? So it, it's even to the end of the, of, the, of the game, I don't want to spoil it for people, but there's a guy who confronts you and says, these are all the horrible things you've done throughout the game. Just to give, just drive that emotional moment home for you at every screwed up thing that you've had to do throughout the game. I think that's a wonderful way, again, it's not so much what you're doing, but how you're doing it that counts to people. I you can hold that as an individual too, which is cool. I feel that it's interesting, it's kind of like TV in the sense that, uh, you know, one of the main differences between TV and, and film is that film is plot driven, whereas TV is character based, right? And some of my like most memorable story moments in video games aren't necessarily the plot. It's for instance in KOTOR where I found out one of my, you know, companions who had been playing with for 10 hours, 12 hours, was now I had to either kill her or, you know, kick the other guy off the ship. And that was a really difficult moment for me. I didn't even know what happened in the game anymore, but like I remember that <laughs> so clearly. Um, and I think, you know, it, that's what we should strive for. I mean, plot needs to be there, but, you know, kind of taking a, a page from TV maybe is a, is a good thing and be all about the character. So a couple of you guys mentioned voice acting. Let's talk about voice acting. Uh, has voice acting been a net positive in our ability to tell stories, or has it restricted us to a narrower story path? In your I like it. I think it's, it's much more immersive that way. I think it's uh, to be able to have somebody talking to you directly as opposed to you having to stop and read or skip through the reading, as it often happens. But to have somebody actually talk to you and you be able to, to see the face and to see the actor and see them emote, I think it gives you a lot more context for how you're supposed to be feeling as a character in that game. I love voice acting. Um, I think it's wonderful. It gives you such a range of what you can do with the same dialogue. And um, a lot of the work I do, it requires synthetic voices because what's being created is being created at that moment sometimes. So we don't have the option of a voice actor all the time. And I, I think it adds an incredible richness. Yeah, I think it's necessary and constraining both. Uh, you know, it's like I, in my, in my heart of hearts, I wish we didn't have to do it. But in my head and in my wallet, I know we do. 
Uh, as a sidebar, does every other male actor have to be Nolan North? And sorry, Nolan. Nolan's an amazing actor, yeah. but he's so good. He is yeah. literally in every other. He, game. he has a contract with the entire video game industry. Yeah. Yeah. He's in it, every game it has to be. That's Nolan on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I, I think you know, voice acting again goes that, back to that dichotomy of video games, where I think it can be a huge asset, right? And I think it can create a lot of uh, connection with the player. Uh, and then sometimes a game doesn't need it and shouldn't record it, but maybe feel they need it and do it anyways, and it does, dist does uh, take away from the experience. But I think, you know, we're humans, we like relationships, we like to hear people and see people, and, and like you said, if you're talking to a character, that you've, a companion, you know, or, or something like that, seeing them, looking them in the eye, having them talk to you, hearing in their voice, you know, uh, what they're feeling, it just has a much more powerful effect than just reading text, I feel. I mean, what the, going back to tech, what I would really love to see, and it's kind of matched to, uh, to facial capture again, is if we can get to the point where body language is, you know, as realistic as we have in real life, that would be amazing. Because what's so sad so many times, you know, doing voiceover, especially for a game that doesn't have facial capture at all, is we'll give these great dynamic, or the actors give these great dynamic performances, but then it'll be on a model that just looks dead. Right, and so it, it works a little bit, and then you still feel it, and it, but it's not the same as gesturing with their hands like I'm doing, or you know, flinching from you and things like that. Yeah, but, is so hard to but you're triple A. I'm low budge, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I I think back to let's say Starcraft, where there's a little about 80 by 80 pixel thing of Jim Rayner, mm. <laughs> you know, and the voice acting made it. It gave a plot. It gave characters that people got to know and loved that was not intended, I don't think, by the, the authors, the people who wrote the game. But they found, oh, the character has this following. In the new versions, we've got to make these central elements. And it, all it was was you know, fairly cheesy voice acting. But it was good enough, and it made the difference. And I thought that was really cool. I don't think it all has to be AAA awesome. I often think, what can I do on a really low budget? And a little voice, to me, goes a long way. Yeah, that's true. I can, I can back that up. Uh, I mean, it goes back a long ways to 1994, but uh, when the original System Shock came out, um, I was working for Origin, which was owned by Electronic Arts. And uh, to be frank, we were forced to ship the floppy disk version. This is how old it is. But we were forced to ship the floppy disk version of System Shock in September of 1993, 94. And then um, it, and it, it did okay, and the reviews were sort of okay. and. And then in January of the following year, we shipped the, the CD-ROM version, which had all of the voice acting. The, the, the floppy version was silent, and the, um, uh, the CD version had, had all the voice. Um, and there were no characters. There were no living characters on the ship, the, on Citadel Station, which is where the game is set. But there are all these video logs and V-mails and, and things like that, and just having a little squidgy, 80 pixel tall, you know, head that was going na 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 na, it just didn't work silent, you know, where you had to read text. But once the voices came in, um, the the very few outlets that actually re-reviewed the game said this game is great, you know. All of a sudden, it just just that one change made all the difference in the world. Well, I think uh, another example that's really cool about voice is making such a big difference uh, is Bioshock, right? So you have the audio logs, and in that game, again, I don't necessarily love the plot. I don't think the plot's like groundbreaking. Don't tell Ken with me. <laughs> yeah, don't tell Ken that, man. <laughs> but I do love... No, he'll the, actually say that. I love the environment. I love the environmental storytelling and the fact that I can walk around in this world and listen to, you know, what happened. I think that's so cool that you never would have been able to do with text. I mean, it gives well, a whole the thing with Bioshock, though, is it... The, the whole, Ken's whole point was trying to flip the switch, there, flip it, the narrative a little, that he was playing with the fact that you, in a lot of games you play the cipher, you are the nameless cipher, and so you notice in the game everybody's telling you to do stuff, like would you kindly, would you kindly, so that was the whole, that was the whole big reveal, that would you kindly, the whole time you're being manipulated, because it would be stupid things, like would you kindly hit that button, would you kindly pick this thing up, and you would have, as a player would of course always do it, because someone was just, you know, asking you to do it, so you, that was, oh I'll do that, I'll do that, and at the end of the game you realize that He's led you through the nose through the entire game, and that's you know, so you know that was sort of the whole, and he will be the first to admit actually, 
that wasn't any radical thing. It was, it's, it's, that was the whole, so the whole narrative wrapped around that. Mm. I can, it, it, has any, how many of you have played System Shock 2? Do you mind if I give you a, do a spoiler? Does anybody mind if I do a spoiler? I think the statute of limitations is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1989. <laughs> um, sorry, you lose. Um, so, you know, Ken was the lead writer on that. Yeah, and, no, he, and he and the team did something very similar to that in that in System Shock 2, you, you think you've got a, the voice in your head, which is critical to basically every game. You know, telling you what's really going on because as a player you don't know anything about the world. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, you're you're listening to this voice in your head who's helping you throughout the entire game, and there comes a point in the game where you realize it's Shodan, yeah, <laughs> the the evil AI, and you've been manipulated throughout the entire game to do exactly what you want. So that's a that's a little trope that Ken plays over and over again. I think that which hey, which says that he's a bit of a notorious telling the same story over, and over again. It, which is a good thing. All right. So state of the art. I mean, we talked about a few games here. You know, what is the current state of the art, or are there what games do you see? You're like, wow, these 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 folks know what they're doing. This is a really innovative and cool, cutting edge way to do narrative and story. I don't I don't know if Uncharted Four was actually cutting edge in the sense. That the narrative wasn't very spectacular, but the, the really, it's one of the most polished efforts I think I've seen, period. Just from one end to the other, the, the voice acting, the plot, the characters, I, it was levels above what the previous stuff had been in the series and through much most of other people. Can you tell me I'm wrong now? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I typically don't talk about other people's games because I don't want them talking about mine. <laughs> We're trying uh, to say nice things now. So. Yeah, you know, I, even though I, I don't I don't exactly make games like I I think the Telltale guys are pretty good at telling yeah. stories. Uh, they're they kind of fall into that adventure gamey cinematic y stuff that usually I don't like very much, but um, they manage to the the emotion in, involved in all the choices and the emotional content of them I think is is really powerful uh, and I think they do that better than anybody else right now. Yeah, I think one of the neat things they added recently was group play. Yeah. Right, which they did in the last uh, Walking Dead, I think in Batman or whatever before that. So you can have a bunch of people sitting around their cell phones, and when it comes to a decision point, you can actually vote. So it's like watching a movie together, but then deciding uh, together which way you're going to go from there. I think yeah. that's kind of a cool, innovative feature. As well. You know, it's funny because I, I actually did some testing for Sony 20 years ago, that where in the theater they actually built in uh, controllers on the, the armrests of the chairs. And everybody in the audience got to vote on what happened in a movie. Mm -hmm. Everything new is old again. Or, I mean, everything old is new again. Sorry. Oh. Uh, I think uh, one game that really excited me that we worked on uh, was Life is Strange. And I think the reason why is it's effectively the coming of age story of a teenage girl in Oregon. Right? And in the first one, she did have the ability to rewind time. Uh, in the subsequent prequel, those type of superpowers are gone. And I just think it's cool. Uh, you know, whether it's state of the art, I think it's cool that we're exploring different types of stories and games now than, uh, you know, I love, you know, post-apocalyptic and space marines like anyone, but it's really cool that those exist. And, uh, you know, are they better as movies? Are they better as games? I don't know, because I think that it allow it, it makes you make choices, which is interesting, and that's the whole, like, Telltale and, and, and Don't Nod, uh, their games, their walking simulators, if you will, is it makes you make these choices and deal with repercussions, and I think that's it's interesting to, uh, to explore that. You know, I don't know. I was something else came to mind, mm -hmm. and it was kind of doing a lot in a challenging situation. I mean, I don't really care what the story is in Cuphead. I mean, it's <laughs> it's a boss battle game, um, but it's a nice story, and I like the story. My kids are playing it all the time. I've got five kids. I something that struck me, and this is not state of the art was the game Valiant Hearts, which was also a platformer shooter. Mm -hmm. But it put a story in there in a subtle way that kind of reached out to people, and they kind of have a surprise at the end. And one of my five children's autistic. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time he had an emotional reaction to a game. He'd been playing this platformer, and then he hears how the character dies and the way the story's told. And it's very true to what the experience was like for World War I in many ways 
other ways not. It's not quite like Mario action, you know. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the fact that they were able to connect with an autistic child in a way that was a, pl you know, a platformer, a little 2D shooter game, I thought was really freaking cool. And, and there was something about how they did that. It wasn't technology. It wasn't being state of the art. It was just the artistry of inserting those little facts in and those little storyline into a fairly thin game. That's just what came to mind at the moment. Yeah, I was kind of surprised none of you mentioned, um, I don't know if it's state of the art necessarily, and I'm, I have mixed feelings about it in general, but one of the things that surprised me narrative over the last few years was Bastion, uh, which has this interactive technology-based narrator. So every time you do anything, it's like, and then he picked up the cup. And then, you know, every, so it, and it worked, it was subtle, and you know, toward the end, I guess, I, I don't know if it's something you do in every game, but it had this cool sort of, I'm gonna go left now, and then he went left, you know? And it just, it had this cool technique that I think was worth exploring. I think, I think it kind of wore out its welcome in their sequel. Um, they tried something similar, but I thought Bastion really, really nailed it. So where do we go? Uh, you know, we got four of you here. Where do you want to see us go in the next five years with Storytel? That's an easy one. Right? <laughs> this is where you want That's to see us. That's all it takes for one game. <laughs> prediction is a fool's game. <laughs> no, uh, this isn't prediction. It's where you want to go, not where we will go. So I mean, I think for me, it goes back to that dichotomy, right? Is I think there's the opportunity with technology improving and, and, and uh, animation looking amazing to have these personal stories and these really cool stories like The Life of Stranges and, and, and explore how do we tell stories in games and what stories are appropriate for games. I mean, you have things like Gone Home and, 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 and things like that that are these really games, you know? But it's a cool way to explore and I'm excited that we have these indie developers exploring that and seeing what other stories can we tell, how else can we tell stories uh, I think that's really exciting. Uh, I mean, I don't think AAA cinematic -y games are going away, and I think that's good too, because those are fun to play. But uh, I really like to see people kind of pushing the envelope about what stories we can tell uh, from what perspectives and, and things like that. I think it's fun. Yeah, I'd like to see the tools get easier for people to use for indie developers. I mean, we get stuff like Kentucky Route Zero, for instance, right? That's a really neat, innovative uh, narrative game. And the kind of style that they're using there, if that's something that a small team could then pull off in a quick time, and this, this guy is basically doing it as a single developer. It's taking him forever to come out with each chapter. I'd like to see him, uh, the tools evolve to the point where lots of different people could pull that kind of stuff off more quickly. Yeah, I feel like I answered the question already. Sure. All right. Right. You know, uh, but uh, uh, the ability to dynamic, I mean, dynamic gameplay adjustment, not dynamic difficulty adjustment, but dynamic gameplay adjustment. So the, the, the play, the, the narrative can really belong to the player and that non-combat AI. I'd love to see somebody tackle those two things. They, they probably go together pretty well. Yeah. Other media, um, outside of games, specifically outside of games, where, uh, where do you see interesting approaches to narrative and storytelling in other media that you would love to see us look at or examine or play with in our media? Well, and uh, the examples I threw up here were uh, Sleep No More, if you are not aware of it, check it out. It's in New York City now, it used to be in Boston. I had the chance to check it out when Boston was back. It's, it's Othello, participatory Othello, which is <laughs> really weird, but very cool. And the other is, of course, uh, Prairie Home Companion, which is, used to be here in the Midwest. But what do you guys see as other really striking approaches to narrative, interesting stuff in narrative and other media that you would like to play with in our media? Well, I, I don't know if it's particularly innovative or new, but uh, television has, has kind of perfected what I, I call a limited serial narrative, where you've got um, individual episodes that each have their own mini arc. They, they come to a conclusion. I mean, think about um, you know police uh, procedurals, right? I mean, there's a crime solved in, in every episode, but there's an overarching narrative that goes for the entire season. Mm -hmm. And I think television has now really nailed that. And I think now that we've got to be thinking about long tail stuff, uh, I think we can learn something from, from television in that regard. Yeah, I like that. Okay, I'll, I'll say something that's probably impossible. 
I mean, I would like to see games where, where, you know, it's not so linear or it's not so just linear, or straight branching, but there's a variety of ways for the plot to unfold and the, the characters to unfold. And I would like not only to see that experience set in a game, but I'd like to be able to print and read a book that tells the story afterwards of my game and the game I played with some sort of richness and characters and dialogue and things going on. Uh, that would be really terrific. Uh, the other thing, there's there's a thing in Santa Fe called the uh, Meow Wolf. Does anybody know about that? Yeah, yeah? it's uh, it's an exploratory space that that tells a bunch of stories. Basically, uh, it's it's is it an art installation? Is it a theme park attraction? Is it a story? Is it? It's hard to tell, and it's but it's it's kind of interesting uh, in that everything in there has some purpose. It's not just random stuff. And if you look at the, the, I can't remember what they're called, the, the locked rooms, the escape, escape rooms. Room. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the level, of, I mean, it's basically one room, you know? And um, every, again, everything in there is, it's not simulated because it's real, but uh, if we could just get to the point where we can make one room deeply enough simulated that, that there are multiple stories to tell in that one space, I think it'd be pretty cool. Uh, and I think the escape rooms are starting to get some of that. I actually did something like this at the, the streets of old Milwaukee at the Milwaukee Public Museum. They did a, a 50th anniversary of it, and they re, uh, renovated a lot of the area, but they didn't want to change a whole lot of it. So what they did is they hired me to write a story that was actually an interactive narrative that you went through by walking throughout the streets. So if you wanted to make one decision to go this way, that would actually trigger off a Bluetooth beacon mm -hmm. that would then put you on a different path in the audio adventure that you were playing through your, through your uh, cell phone as you went through. And I think it'd be neat to see that kind of thing brought out to a broader kind of a, an area as opposed to just this one tack down part of, uh, of the museum and stuff. That was a lot of fun, I had a great time working on it. I think uh, a cool place too for stories and, and, and building empathy and, and feeling for people and, and just is, uh, is VR. I think that's really a crazy thing. I think it's very much in its infancy. I think uh, yeah. Ted Shilowitz, uh hit described it as the, uh, the Gordon Gecko cell phone right now. You know, it's still a ways out before it really takes off. But I, I remember I was at a conference last year, and there was this one VR experience that was an uh, actual 911 call that they then uh, animated to. And you're standing in the middle of uh, domestic abuse in this house. And it's like, it's insane, right? To see it happen and hear the, the actual dialogue. And I think that because you're there, it's different than watching it on the screen, whether it's a movie, whether it's a video game. So I think it's uh, in terms of telling stories, in terms of making us feel things, and, and having this experience of things, it's a really exciting museum. I, I've got one last one on that. Sure. Um, I saw some experiments. I didn't do this work myself in audio VR. Uh, it is audio only, and people are just told a story. And in this study, people were, participants were asked, just by listening through headphones, can they recreate the place they were walked through sort of like a dungeon, like you're in a story for a dungeon master and be able to visualize that. I think that could be a real cool, I mean, I think like Pokemon Go is an augmented reality phone game in the geolocation. It was such a thin experience. But I think about, you know, you're in your old town and you want to explore the ghosts of the historical town or whatever. And just with, I mean, I just think that yes, you could have visuals, you could have mixed reality. Um, but if it were just audio only, you had like a geolocation sort of game that was a narrative sort of storytelling game. That would be such a treasure for a story writer uh, to be able to use that sort of medium, which which is just words or a voice actor or, t or several of them. I, I just think the potential that would be cool without all the AAA and shooting and all the other things. I think it would just be about writing good stories. And, and in some ways, I feel we've lost something since we got graphics. And if, if, once, if anybody's played a text adventure recently, I strongly encourage you to do so if you haven't, because there was really something special about that. And I think that maybe we can write better stories by eliminating some of the sense of senses. senses yeah. and stuff. And I was something called Earplay that does that, right? They do uh, interactive audio adventures. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never heard of that. Uh, it's Jonathan, what's his name? Cameron. Oh. But it's a bunch of guys who used to work for Telltale, too. Oh, right on. Yeah, so Earplay, check it out. It's on yeah. iTunes. Right. There's actually, there's actually one thing. I, if I had all the time in the world and all the money in the world and just could experiment, I, I don't, you, Brent, I'm glad you brought up text adventures. Uh, 
text adventures were interesting, but they were always limited by how limited the parser was. You know, if it didn't know the word, the immersion was completely broken. And I'm, I'm surprised that no one's really experimented with that moving forward because we have the ability to do such complex parsers now that you could really create textually, no sound, no graphics, no anything, something really interesting. And no one really has yeah. moved forward with that because even, even in only eight bit days, you had no memory, you know, and you could still get away with some really interesting stuff. And for, for me, the reason they always fell short was because I would enter a word that it didn't know, and then boom, the immersion's completely gone. But again, you know, I remember a game, Shadow of the Hound, the, on the Amiga from like a million years ago. And at the beginning of the game, you make up a little Call of Cthulhu character, and it's a throwaway, you're like, yeah, whatever. And I, you, know, you choose a profession, and it seems like a throwaway. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be an author. And I'm in the middle of the game, crazy stuff's happening in London, and some person just walks up to me and says, hey, aren't you that author? And you know, starts wants an autograph and has a conversation with you. And this was all a textual game. And this was, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And it's just it's amazing to me no one's really experimented with it right. further because I, I think that would be at least an intellectually interesting prospect. I don't know if it would be commercially successful, but it would I, be hell of fun. My comment about that is I agree. I don't think gameplay has gotten any more fun in the last 20 years. But I think we have gotten better at telling stories in, in like it, it reinforcing to the community that narrative is important, and I don't I don't remember hearing that everywhere 15, 20 years ago, and it's it's ubiquitous now. So I think we've had some progress. 15 years ago, I was in a room with a bunch of executives for a company I will not name, and I was told, Warren, you're not allowed to say the word story ever again. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Things have changed. All right. Well, at that point. I want to give some time to you folks in the audience. Hit us up with questions. Uh, I will share out my mic. Can I do that? All right. That way they don't have to give up theirs. So uh, we'll start over here. We'll go around. Um, is this on? Hi. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for, like, like just adding character quirks with, like, to the playable character without overbearing? the player's agency? I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Any tips for non-player characters? Be a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that casting can in any way affect a game's story, like if a particularly good performance changes the meaning of a line? Um, could that have any effect, uh, effect on a script at all? Oh, of course. Actually, I'm working on a game right now that hasn't been announced, but uh, the, uh, they said, we have such a good actor on here, go ahead and write more lines for him. <laughs> right? Go ahead and let him you know, expound and have a hellacious monologue just because he's that good. Yeah, I mean, I think casting has a huge effect, right? It's the actor. Like, the written word is the skeleton, but the actor brings it to life. And I know with all of our clients, whenever they come, not all, but many of our clients, their favorite part of the entire game development process is hearing the actor finally bring those words to life and do things they never would have thought of. Uh, we were casting a project once, and uh, it was really cool because uh, our client basically described how we found the lead actress, right? It was like finding your wife. You start off, and you think you only, you only want to date a blonde girl, and you know, you're sure you're gonna marry this blonde girl, but all of a sudden, you know, you meet a brunette, and you fall in love. And uh, that's exactly what happened. We were casting this board game, and uh, the female lead, everyone imagines she's this tough female lead, you know, she's tall and slender and sexy and all this you know, video game -y stuff. Uh, and then we have this amazing actress come in and audition, and uh, she was shorter, she had a pixie, a pixie haircut, uh, just not at all what anyone imagined, but she was perfect for the part and completely changed, uh, completely changed the character. So I think it's, it's a huge impact. If you're gonna, if you're gonna have voices, you're gonna have Hi there. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, procedurally generating narrative on the fly to actually change the game. Uh, and, and if any of you have experienced that kind of thing and where you think that could go or any advice on that kind of thing, because I'm kind of interested in it. Uh, that's based on some of the research at my institute. Where we mostly use canned responses, but there might be a variety of them that are chosen. So 
So we might instantly generate the canned response, but there's then work where you're actually generating the actual sentences. And it was based out of um, negotiation research, the negotiation game. Um, the problem is that the computers um, often sound unnatural sometimes, and individuals or people are very have very low tolerance to things that break reality or sound a little strange, um, and that's the problem. This is not the systems just aren't good enough yet. But, but there's plenty of great computer science work to be done in that area. Thank you. So I know that you guys have been talking a lot about like voice actors and like plot development and like that, but not a whole bunch on like the scenario driven areas or even like the music that goes behind the characters. Can you elaborate a little bit on that for plot development? Music is huge in games. I mean, it, I can't tell you how much it bothers me that most people turn their sound off, you know? <laughs> um, it, it, in a, a sense, we're, we're finally moving beyond what I'm about to say, but up until very recently, we've basically been making radio plays, you know? I, I mean, our, our graphics have not been uh, all that great. And again, things are changing now. Um, but uh, play Epic Mickey with the sound turned down, and it's a completely different experience than it is with the sound turned up. We had uh, Jim Dooley, who's an Emmy-winning uh, composer, do the soundtrack for the game, and I, I mean, I, I told him I've been waiting my entire life to make a game that's worthy of a soundtrack like that. Uh, and you can buy it on iTunes, or at least you used to be able to, so I, I strongly recommend doing it. Did, if anybody remember Pushing Daisies, the TV show Pushing Daisies? Yeah. He did all the music for Pushing Daisies really amazing guy and the emotional content uh, the emotional effect of the game just went way up, way way up, uh, and really supported and, and built on uh, or built up the, the storyline dramatically it's hugely important yeah I second that music is you know it's, it's, it's key uh, I think there's this great uh, experiment so uh, the Dracula from I think the 1930s uh, is silent it, it, not silent in terms of dialogue but it has but oftentimes, if you go see it in theater, like during Halloween or something like that, they'll have a live accompaniment, right? And it's amazing the difference to having like, like I saw it with Philip Glass when I was on the Board, and it yeah. was an amazing experience watching this movie, and the music just changed uh, how it was uh, I remember in film school, they would show us a video, they'd have a scene, and you had scary music on it. It'd be scary. And then they'd put some silly music, and all of a sudden, it wouldn't be scary anymore. Uh, the music just has a dramatic I, I can talk loud. Um, <laughs> then we'll go back to you. Uh, in, in this discussion, you've talked a lot about uh, both the narrative and uh, uh, character performance. But do you ever think about how you, the tools you can give the player to for their performance like between uh, uh, I don't know fighting styles in a combat situation, or even like the thing that I think about a lot is in a boy and his blob for the Wii. There's a hug button. And it did. It had no gameplay function, but whenever you used that button, it informed you about what that relationship was, and it let you perform inside of that role. Do you, ever, uh, uh, do you guys ever think about how you can let the player be a better actor? I might now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really interesting idea. I haven't thought about that. So no. Maybe that's a, what you could add. Your one new thing. <laughs> Back there, um, do you feel like a um, focus on uh, spectacle and um, using the narrative to string together a bunch of visually impressive um, set pieces is a um, problem? that uh, the industry is currently, um, is going to have more of, or do you think that's something that might uh, be waning away uh, as time goes on? I don't think that's gonna wait away. I, that's, uh, all I have to do is look at cinema to see that's exactly where all that stuff is going, right? For AAA entertainment, 
especially stuff that has to be sold across cultural barriers, has to be sold into China, has to be sold into all, all across Asia and, and uh, in Europe, and et cetera. Um, spectacle is one of those things that translates really well, right, without having to use any kind of language. And I think because of that, you're gonna see people relying, at least in the short term, like the next 10, 15 years, more and more on that, even in games as opposed to just any other kind of media. I mean, in games we can do things that you can't do in cinema and you can't do in television, especially for budgetary reasons, and we just blow the doors off stuff. So I think that's one thing we really do spectacularly well at, to find out. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's just the thing. So. What do you guys think? Yeah, so are you, are, are you saying that using narrative as a band-aid for spectacle and, and not have it integrated? Because I think that's always a problem. If, say, a designer knows he wants to make a game with these cool levels, but he doesn't think about the story until later, I think that always ends up being a pretty bad story and not the best game, um, which I think is sometimes a problem. Uh, with how people approach games, movies, anything. You know, like if all you know is like, I wanna make a scary movie, and it has a crazy clown, that's cool, but that's not a plot, that's not the entire thing. I think mean, you have to, in pre-production, figure out what your story is, how that matches with your gameplay, why you end up, you know, across the country on level three, things like that. Yeah, but like with everything else, execution is everything, right? I mean, if it's done poorly, it's gonna suck. It doesn't matter how much the budget is for, or how spectacular it is. If you have good writers, good directors, good producers, that kind of thing can be done amazingly well, too. But it's really got to do with the, the quality of the, of the execution. Yeah, I've, I've tried starting with the big set pieces. Um, you know, I've made up a list of, you know, given the, um, the setting and the context, wouldn't it be cool if this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened, and then tried afterwards to, to stitch them together? And it may work for some people, but boy, it sure didn't work for me. I, I just couldn't make it work. So I, there are clearly people who can, and, and I don't think it's going well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, we got one more. Back here. And then we will have a break after this if you want to corner someone just <laughs> have a further conversation. What are your preferred storytelling techniques that aren't related in some way to writing or cinematography or something. What is something specific to gameplay and, and game games period that is a technique you use for storytelling? You guys ask tough questions, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, one of the interesting things about games is that you often don't even get to see the character that you're playing, right? And that becomes a real challenge. Uh, if you're just doing first person type stuff, to, to be able to have that character emote and to be somebody you can relate to, even though you never actually see their face and maybe you never even hear their voice. I mean, a lot of people care about Gordon Freeman, but who the hell is he, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a real challenge for doing video games. Um, and I think as a technique, it's just a matter of using every tool in your kit to try to get people to care about it, right? Really the main thing about any kind of game is the context that you put things into. That's what a story is in a video game. The, the gameplay itself might be really innovative or whatever, or it might be the same kind of thing you've seen for 10 years. But if you put it in the right context, even old stale gameplay suddenly becomes fresh and exciting and engaging and new, right? That's the reason we have more and better developed stories as we go along, is because that's what, gives, that's what makes us care about first person shooter stuff. Right? Otherwise, we're just shooting things, and who the hell cares? But if you have great artwork and music and storytelling and acting and everything else, that becomes a visceral experience that you can care about in different ways every time. Well, the, first of all, I mean, just I don't even want to get into it in, in any detail, but I mean, we have environments, right? I mean, that you're exploring, the, in, and they can tell a story. But for me, the big thing is having a world that notices and responds to what you're doing. Uh, and characters that notice and respond to what you're doing. I mean, to this day, the thing people remember most about Deus Ex is the fact that you can go into the women's bathroom and your boss says, hey, you shouldn't do that, <laughs> you know? But it, it's that, that idea of, of the world noticing and responding is something that no other medium can do. Um, and it's, it happens throughout the game, not just the women's bathroom scene. I mean, in the, in the very first mission, you can kill everything that moves, or you cannot kill anything that moves, 
and there's one character who says, how could you let them all live? They're, they're terrorists, they deserve to die. And there's someone else who says, how could you, how, why didn't you kill them all? The, yeah, I mean, sorry, the other way around. You know what I mean, right? I'm getting confused now. Um, <laughs> But, but having the world notice and respond to what you're doing is something that only we can do, and so we should probably do more of it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you know, one of the really cool things about video games is you allow the player to make choices and they can make their own stories. You know, even if you look at a strategy game that may not have a plot, I mean, I have very fond memories of playing you know, these RTSs and whatnot growing up and remembering, oh my god, I almost took over Europe and then they invade the Huns or whatever happened. And then, oh, this guy, you create your own stories. And that's what's cool about games is that you have that ability. Um, and that's the reason I think there are so many different ways to tell stories and experience stories in games. Um, so we should have all of them. See, I don't do what you say and what you're asking about, but I hire people to do. <laughs> and I try to, like I collect warped writers, and I, predict, I try to pick the right warp for the project because kind of milk toast writers don't do it for me. It's like comedians. They're often very pained people, the best comedians. It's something similar in good writing. And so and if I'm doing something that's particular, I said, I know that guy, you really twisted his heart. You'll be great for this project. And so I rely on my writing talent a lot, personally, because I'm more in a director role, usually. All right, well, we're over time. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you. For coming.